And welcome to the Birch Aquarium at Scripps. I'm Nigella Hilgarth. I'm the executive director here at the aquarium. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. This is the latest in our Perspectives on Ocean Science series, the Jeffrey B. Graham lecture series. And each month, this series offers the public a chance to learn about exciting topics in earth, earth and marine research directly from the Scripps scientists. And tonight's presentation is a final in a series of three on marine protected areas and near shore research in Southern California. And the process of establishing a network of MPAs in Southern California's state waters is already well underway. And perhaps no one is more aware of that than some members of the audience tonight who represent the key decision makers in California's MLPA initiative process. And we've got several members of the Southern Coast Regional Stakeholder Group and the science advisory team in the audience. And so thank you for all the hard work and thank you very much for attending tonight. It's great to have you here. We are very fortunate to have two very distinguished presenters this evening. Brian Baird, who is the Assistant Secretary for Ocean and Coastal Policy with the California Resources Agency, and Russ Moll, who is the Director of the California Sea Grant. And I'm going to introduce both of our speakers, not at once, but um, one after the other tonight, so I don't interrupt their, their talk. And I'm going to start with the Assistant Secretary for Ocean and Coastal Policy with the California Resources Agency, Mr. Brian Baird. Now, Brian is a real veteran of ocean policy in California. He served under three governors, Schwarzenegger, Davis, and Wilson. And he represents the state of California as the chair emeritus of the uh, Coastal States Organization, and he was previously chair of the Ocean Policy Committee. And he's authored and co-authored papers on ocean management, liquefied natural gas facility siting, archaeological resources, oil spill contingency planning, marine managed areas, and coastal economics. And he's also been the chief writer of several guiding documents for California's ocean policy, including Governor Schwarzenegger's 2004 Protecting Our Ocean, California's Strategy for Action. He also loves surfing in Southern California. <laughs> Dr. Russ Moll has worked as a member uh, and director of research teams. He's also uh, an administrator of many research programs. He's also been a program officer in a federal agency. And all of these activities have been in one form of aquatic science or another. In fact, I don't really know anyone who's had such a diverse uh, history in aquatic sciences. He's done research in nearshore marine environment, in salt marshes, in mangrove systems in Africa, <laughs> the Great Salt Lakes, Little Lakes, and temperate and tropical rivers. So he's really uh, very uh, distinguished in many different forms of aquatic science. And in 1989, he became director of the Cooperative Institute for Limology and Ecosystem Research at the University of Michigan. In 1994, he took leave to serve as an associate program director in the Biological Oceanography Program in the National Science Foundation. And when he returned to Michigan, he became director of the Sea Grant Program there. And in 1998, he became the associate director of Michigan's biological station. And then in the year 2000, he came to the University of California, San Diego to become head of California's Sea Grant program. So tonight, both Brian and Russ are going to discuss the intricate processes of establishing and evaluating MPAs, not only the state level, but the national and the international level. So this is a unique opportunity to hear from two of the state's most established voices on ocean issues. So please join me in welcoming both of them for their talk, Marine Protected Areas, coming soon to a coast near you. Thank you, Thank you very much. That down there. Well, I am Brian Baird, and I'm the Assistant Secretary for Ocean and Coastal Policy for the California Resources Agency. Unfortunately, Secretary Chrisman couldn't be here uh, tonight. He had his plane reservations made. Something came up on Friday afternoon, and I got the call, which I get once in a while, and, and indeed giving the talk. However, this is a great story, uh, and a story that needs to be told, and, and I really enjoy uh, 
telling it. And I love the fact that we have a, a full house of people who are engaged in this because kind of the thesis of my, my comments tonight is we need involvement from stakeholders, we need involvement from scientists in just about anything we do in the oceans, certainly with the Marine Life Protection Act. This act is part of the governor's overall ocean agenda, which is what I do. I'm a, an advisor to the governor's office. And uh, Governor uh, Schwarzenegger, when he was running, he basically made oceans and coasts a major priority that was very clear before he took office and very clear after he took office. And being a former action hero, he, he basically wanted, well, <laughs> action. Uh, and that was, was not in an Austrian accent. That gets me in trouble. Uh, but uh, he made very strong comments right after he came uh, into, uh, into office to the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy on their draft plan. And he said, we've got to be dynamic. We've got to make some things happen here nationally. So he made very, very strong comments and really was a, a factor in making that report do uh, what it, it does, does very well. But he also said, I'm not going to stand on the sidelines here. I want to see an action plan in California. But he said, I don't want an action plan in two years or three years or four years. I want an action plan on my desk in 90 days. So 90 days later, I walked across the street from the Resources Agency over to the governor's office. And I'll never forget it, 4.50 PM, handed them the action plan. October 18th, the governor released this action plan at Point Lobos State Marine Reserve with kind of his characteristic flair. He was with Leon Panetta, former chief of staff president Clinton, Clint Eastwood, who many of you heard about and of, and uh, he was a Parks Commissioner at the time, and Secretaries Chrisman from the Resources Agency and Taminen from uh, California Environmental Protection Agency. And here you're out in this remote site in Point Lobos, and the place is just crawling with press. And we had press all over the place. And when you do what I do, that's good. You need, we need to get the message out of the importance of the ocean. We need leaders like the governor to, to get that, uh, that message out. And the release of that document received national attention. And now I, I was chair, I, now chair emeritus, that's my fancy term for no longer chair, uh, but uh, of the Coastal States Organization. And when I address that organization, they are so inspired by the work that's happening in California, certainly with the leadership of the governor, but the work that all of you are doing. His action plan had 13 actions, most of which are implemented. Two key ones, though, were establishing the California Ocean Protection Council and, of course, implementing the Marine Life Protection Act. A word on the Ocean Protection Council. We've invested $30 million, over $30 million already, in projects to help with governance, to help with water quality and fisheries, uh, once through cooling and at power plants and the impacts of those plants, looking at marine debris and, and looking at the kind of research we need. But the key to the California Ocean Protection Council is that when you, you look at, the, at the, what we've learned nationally in, in, in the state, there's a lot of fragmentation in government. So the Ocean Protection Council is doing out-of-the-box things. They're looking for problems, looking for issues, and saying, how can we invest strategically to make some things happen with, with many of these issues? And there's a lot of activity happening. In fact, the next uh, California Ocean uh, uh, Protection Council meeting is uh, November 20th and 21st at the Port of Los Angeles, and I would encourage you all to go and see this in action. If you can't, you can watch it on the internet, which has also been a great tool for us. Um, also pleased to be here because through the Ocean Protection Council, we've worked closely with Scripps uh, Institution and funded projects like uh, ichthyoplankton surveys, uh, sea level rise scenarios. Uh, there was a project dealing with La Jolla Shores, uh, areas of special biological significance done work on ocean acidification and uh, thresher shark studies. But these are the kinds of partnerships now we're linking as to the degree that we can our, our governance at the highest levels, at the levels that are advising the governor with our academic institutions and with people. This has been a really fantastic and productive relationship. Uh, and the Ocean Protection Council and the Resources Agency also funds Russ's, uh, puts a lot of money into Russ's uh, organization, the Sea Grant organization. Right now, we're somewhere around 1.2 million a year that we put into this research. And Russ, I'm not sure, but I think probably more than any other state uh, in the nation contributes its state Sea Grant program, which is a great program because they do research, but they're really involved with connecting that research with people and applying it on the ground. Um, one thing I did uh, through the governor's office, I was a chief negotiator in 
bringing together the uh, West Coast Governor's Agreement on Ocean Health, which was signed by Governor Schwarzenegger, Kulangoski of Oregon, and Gregoire of Washington in 2006, which is at a, a conference that I help run. It's California and the World Ocean. This July, the governors released their action plan, 26 specific actions for how these three states now can look regionally. This is one of the messages of the Ocean Commission. Let's start looking regionally at how we, we address problems. And then just two weeks ago, we were up in Seattle with 100 experts looking at each one of these 26 recommendations to figure out how we can do it all on the ground. And the beauty of this when you do what I do is I'm on the phone with the governor's offices of Oregon and Washington weekly now. We are connecting on the things we want to do on, on the entire West Coast, and we're sending those messages to Washington, D.C. We hope with this next administration we'll get a little bit more action in that regard. Um, <laughs> uh, so, lots happening. I wanted to set the stage, though, with the Marine Life Protection Act that this is part of this overall effort on the part of, of, of the govern, uh, governor and this is the part of the commitments that he made to the 36 million or 38 million now people who live here. Moving to the uh, Marine Life Protection Act. This was passed, this act was passed in 1999. It was calling for improvement in the design and the management of marine protected areas, areas that are set aside with certain types of restrictions for uh, use and fishing and other sorts of things. It's really the first effort in the United States to, on a statewide basis to connect a biological network of these areas off the shores. Again, this is another one of these things that's being watched nationally and internationally. And I can guarantee you, you go to a committee hearing in Washington, D.C., you talk about this issue, they're going to talk about California and the struggles uh, that we've had uh, and the successes that we've had. So generally, the Marine Life Protection Act process uh, it requires a master plan to guide the adoption and the implementation of these areas. Very important, we need to use the best readily available science. You're never going to have enough science. So in order to move the ball forward, we're going to use the science that, that we can get. And we're putting a lot of mo money into science, but we can't wait for every answer. We've got to begin to move forward. It called for a master plan science team. So science is interjected into this from the beginning clear involvement of stakeholders, and hopefully the adoption of a marine life uh, protection program by the Fish and Game uh, Commission. It sets clear goals for natural diversity and abundance of marine life, for improving uh, recreation and education regarding these issues, because there's a lot of things we heard in the beginning. We would set up a marine reserve and suddenly you couldn't swim in it or you couldn't snorkel in it or you couldn't do a lot of, well, you can do all those things in these areas. That's what they're for. But the idea is hopefully to make them better. Uh, it's, it's requiring uh, protecting representative and unique habitats. So we're not just going out and finding a reef. We're finding reefs, sandy habitat, other types of, 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 of bottom configurations and so forth. So we're trying to protect a heritage for this, this state uh, with these, these networks. And again, the whole idea is to design and manage MPAs uh, to the extent possible as a network so that we have some connectivity between these sites. So if we're getting some productivity here, are we you know, going to have some spacing where we may see some of that connectivity? This act represents an evolution in, in moving from single species management to really looking at management from an ecosystem uh, management basis, which MPAs are one tool in, in the uh, EBM uh, toolbox. And when I think of ecosystem based management, I try to think of what are we doing here and how is it affecting everything in, in the ecosystem and how are all those things, those incredibly diverse things in the ecosystem, affecting this issue that we're looking at. And I'm I can guarantee you if you put 10 different people in 10 different rooms, you're going to get some different definitions of ecosystem-based management. But I think that's a, a simple uh, an answer to it. We are trying to really look at the larger uh, picture. Now, looking at some history. There were two previous efforts to implement the Marine Life Protection Act. Both of them failed. And they failed, I think, the first one because of lack of a good stakeholder process. Scientists went off in a room for a year and came out with some maps. Now, you can imagine, I was at one of the first uh, workshops or hearings, and the, the, the approach that was being taken was, hey, fishermen, here's a, here's a map, and here's an area don't take it too seriously. We're just thinking about closing the area that you and your father and your grandfather and your great-great-grandfather fish. 
Well, they didn't like that, and uh, I think for good reason. Uh, I th you, you can't go at this kind of a process without talking to people who have a vested interest and talking to people who know these areas and know them well. The other problem at the time was no money. We just did not have the money to run the kind of processes that needed uh, to be uh, put in place. So it was clear that the, when the governor came in that we needed a new, fresh approach, uh, and an approach that was going to have an emphasis on stakeholder in input and good science, and something's going to be fair. So in August 2004, the Resources Agency, uh, my boss, uh, Secretary Mike Chrisman, the Department of Fish and Game, and a group of private funders entered into a public-private uh, partnership and created the Marine Life Protection Act Initiative, which is a very unique uh, initiative, and I'll, I'll try to describe how this, this works. But the basic idea was to create a blue ribbon task force appointed by the Secretary for Resources to guide a process outside, uh, at least initially, of the specific uh, Fish and Game Commission process. And the idea was not to, to pick a, a stakeholder model of a couple of fishermen and a couple of environmentalists and so forth. Uh, the idea was to appoint people because they're intelligent, hopefully, respected by the community, people have, who have dealt with complicated public processes, and most of all, and this is when we went through these lists of people to appoint, are they going to be fair? That is the whole point of this. Could we have some people who would oversee this process who would be fair? The other thing was uh, decided was to use a regional approach uh, to this instead of looking at the entire state because it was just too complex. So we started with the Central Coast from Pigeon Point to Point Conception. Then we went to the North Central Coast, uh, Alder Creek near Point Arena to Pigeon Point. Then the South Coast, which you're all familiar with, Point Conception to the Mexican border. Then we're going to go back up to the far north uh, coast, the California-Oregon border to Alder, Alder Creek near Point Arena. And then finally we're going into San Francisco Bay. So the roles of this process to make this thing happen. Policy advice and overseeing an effort to try to come up with sites that involve stakeholder input and in science. That's the Blue Ribbon Task Force. Then we have stakeholder input, and that's through a statewide uh, stakeholder group and regional stakeholder groups for each of those reason, regions. Then finally, scientific uh, advice through science advisory teams. Now we're on the Blue Ribbon uh, Task Forces. Uh, they were all slightly different. For the Central Coast was the first region that uh, went through the process, is complete. Uh, those, those sites are in place by regulation. The North Central Coast, which is at a, a point where recommendations are being made to the Fish and Game Commission from this task force, and the South Coast, which is just beginning. I wanted to give you a flavor of the, the task force that's been chosen for Southern California. The chair is Don Benninghoven, former executive director of the League of California Cities. Not exactly a guy who, who came in with a perspective necessarily, but someone who is fair, knows how processes work, can listen to information and digest it. William Anderson, president of West Trek Marina Management a different perspective. Meg Caldwell, director and senior lecturer uh, at, St at Stanford uh, Law School's Environment and Natural Resources Program. Susan Golding, president and chief executive, executive of the Golden, Golden Group and former mayor of San Diego. Jane Paisano, president and director of the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles County. Kathy Reheis Boyd, I remember when we made this appointment. It, it, it's great. It's Chief Operating Officer and Chief of Staff of the Western States Petroleum Association on a group dealing with coming up with how we're going to deal with these fishery resources. And Gregory Shem, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Harbor Real Estate Group. The idea, once again, was can we have a group of reasonable, intelligent people who are not coming to this thing with an agenda, listen to evidence presented, and help try to form uh, areas for protection. For stakeholder groups, we have a, a statewide stakeholder group. It's about 20 members. They have a statewide perspective, and what they do is they follow uh, this and have conference calls after every meeting of this Blue Ribbon Task Force to sort of compare notes and see how things are going. We have regional stakeholder groups. There's one regional stakeholder group for each of the regions uh, studied for the Central Coast, North Central, and now South Coast. This to me is the heart of this whole thing. It's about 50 to 60 members and alternates, some of whom are here, tasked with developing MPA proposals. So the idea is put these people in a room, 
pull out the maps, give them all this information on the ecological characteristics, all sorts of information on the bottom types and, and, and anything you know, we can find about these areas, and have them try to come up with proposals for areas that could be protected under the Marine Life uh, Protection Act. And these folks uh, meet approximately 20, uh, 20 full days of meetings and work sessions over a 12-month period. And these are rigorous sessions. And, uh, uh, and, and they're all great people. I mean, I gave the charge to the North Central Group uh, for the secretary. And I just got such a feeling of people who wanted to come together to try to make this happen. Then we have science advisory teams. And that's membership changes slightly to incorporate ex experts from each region but it's about 20 biologists and ecologists and oceanographers and um, economists. And they're charged with providing scientific advice on what these stakeholders come up with. So if the stakeholders come up with a, a, a series of, of areas that they want to uh, uh, protect, the scientists come back and say, well, here's what we think you would achieve potentially with doing that based, again, on that thing that I said uh, off and on, the best available science. And the scientists are not charged with developing their own proposals. They simply give kind of an idea on what would be in, uh, included. Enforcement of these areas. Once we provide all these areas, it's going to be a, a, a huge challenge. And we did up the budget for the Department of Fish and Game and FY0607, but it comes as no surprise it's a challenge right now. And part of this process of bringing everybody together and having this be a community effort is we're going to need the community to help us out there in the water and to let the Department of Fish and Game and others know, uh, you know if, if people are, are doing things that are restricted under the law. Monitoring. How are we ever going to know whether we've made any progress unless we monitor? So we've created a thing called the Monitoring Enterprise, which is leading the development of a comprehensive monitoring uh, uh, effort for the entire uh, suite of the MPA network once it's put together. And they're looking at studies of kelp forests and intertidal rocky reefs, deep water habitat, nearshore fish species, socioeconomic information, uh, et cetera. Now, on November 20th and 21st, the Ocean Protection Council is going to hear a proposal to allocate $12 million to do baseline characterization of the three uh, study regions, uh, future ones, the north central, the south down here, and the north coast. This is really important because we don't know what kind of money we're going to have for science uh, in the future. So we want to, at, at this point, do the best we can with this money to, to get the best snapshot in time on what's going on with the environment so we can come back later and see, well, what has happened? I mean, have we achieved something? I, I, we certainly hope we, we have. Um, and this money is going to go through uh, California um, Sea Grant, through Russ's uh, organization, assuming that it is um, it happens, which will guarantee my annual fruitcake, my Harry and David fruitcake from the Sea Grant uh, program. I get the holiday period. Yeah. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, anyway, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about what's happening in the regions. But before I do, just, I want to briefly explain the three classifications of living marine resources uh, designations. First is a state marine reserve. These are complicated, but I'm going to make it uncomplicated. Basically, it's a no-take area other than for research, restoration, or monitoring. Um, there's a state marine park. That prohibits take for commercial purposes uh, and could place some other restrictions if inconsistent with park objectives. But basically, it's a restriction on commercial uses. And then a state marine conservation area, which is a mix. It could uh, provide uh, uh, prohibitions on commercial, recreational, uh, uh, extraction or of uh, cultural uh, marine resources. So just I, I just have a few. I'm not a PowerPoint guy, so I never do a whole PowerPoint presentation. But there he is, the big guy, the, the governor. Uh, this is when the governor released uh, his action plan uh, in uh, Point Lobos. This has become somewhat of a famous picture. Uh, it's all over the place, but uh, gives you a feeling for what happens when he steps in. And he's, when he steps in, he steps in big. This is the Central Coast, pretty unreadable slide, but just to give you an idea, there are 28 marine protected areas and one state uh, marine recreational management area, which I didn't explain, but that's another designation that helps uh, deal with uh, various recreational management. It's 528 square kilometers, about 18 percent of state waters within this area that is studied. Uh, and uh, there are 13 no-take state marine reserves, which is about 220 square kilometers of the ocean. 
and then 15 uh, state marine conservation areas. The bottom line was this thing started with stakeholders, with scientists looking over the, 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 that, that process of what they were providing. That went to this blue ribbon task force that helped judge what made sense with these various proposals and help craft the proposals. Then the proposals were formally delivered to the Fish and Game Commission, which held another full range of hearings over what ought to happen, and they, they made some additional adjustments. It's a pretty extensive public uh, uh, stake, stakeholder process as well as a science process. Then we go to the North Central, uh, I have to use these, they, they tell me I have to use these terms, it's a North Central Integrated Preferred Alternative. Um, uh, but what that is, is uh, basically this is the stage, uh, this is behind the, what happened with the other one. This is the Blue Ribbon Task Force that has provided a preferred alternative that's gone to the Fish and Game Commission. So the Fish and Game Commission has this before them, they have not acted. Uh, on this yet, but they're well down the road of, of acting on this. It, it, it's pretty much going to happen. But this is uh, 11 state marine reserves, uh, which is about 11.6 percent of the study region, two state parks, uh, and um, then nine state marine conservation areas. Then we move to you folks. This is the South Coast study region, and of course this is without any uh, uh, involvement. I mean, there's involvement with the Marine Life Protection Act, but this is what is currently uh, there. And the South Coast pr provides some unique challenges because there's a lot of people down here. Two thirds of the state population is within this area of the coast, uh, and that presents a whole new dynamic in terms of make sure you get stakeholders that are going to hopefully represent these these people, and just a host of other other issues. There's already uh, more existing MPAs in this area, and we had an extensive process at the Channel Islands that uh, was run uh, in, in collaboration between the uh, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and the State of California. So, and that was done you know, a few years back. It was finally completed. Both the, uh, these are reserves um, in state and federal waters. So uh, the MLPA process is dealing strictly with three nautical miles out. In the Channel Islands, there was a joint process uh, between the state and the federal government. The state acted first and, and, and put these areas in place in state waters. The federal government came back a few years later and extended them out into uh, three nautical miles uh, out into federal waters, taking up all the way, to, for the most part, of many of those to the extent of the, uh, uh, the, the edge of the marine sanctuary, which is that line going around. Water quality, very different characteristics here in Southern California with a lot of people. It's just a, a different dynamic, something that needs to be considered. Uh, uh, in the early stages of, of talking to people, there are questions about beach nourishment activities, uh, where certain communities, uh, certainly down in, in this region, you have uh, nourishment activities of your beaches. Would that be affected by this process? That's something that everybody's trying to figure out how you would tailor this if all the, the communities within Sandag want to do another comprehensive beach nourishment uh, program, which I think they do want to do. We've got some unique uh, Department of Defense um, concerns. Uh, the South Coast study region contains several military areas, including uh, Camp Pendleton, but exercises that are occurring off the coast. And I can guarantee you we're going to hear uh, from the military about th their concerns about these things affecting their uh, areas. <coughs> so the MPA proposals for the South Coast are going to go through three iterations of the stakeholder group in March, and then the summer, and then uh, in September. They'll come up with their draft proposals, then there'll be evaluations and analyses by the entities that I've, I've, I've mentioned, public input, and then ultimately the Blue Ribbon Task Force uh, will do their process, and then it would go to the Fish and Game Commission. The timeline, September 2009, the regional uh, study group is uh, going to uh, develop this MPA uh, network proposals and submit it to the Blue Ribbon Task Force. October 2009, the Blue Ribbon Task Force will choose their preferred alternative. December 2009, uh, they'll present the alternative to the Fish and Game Commission. By mid-2010, the Fish and Game Commission uh, will seek to adopt the proposal, and then by uh, late 2010, the regulations will go into effect. Same process is going to occur with the North Coast starting in the summer of 2009, and then 2010 in San Francisco Bay. So let me conclude by emphasizing, if I haven't emphasized enough, that 
efforts like this at MLPA don't happen without the concerted efforts of a lot of people. And it's a lot of people from a wide range of expertise and, and uh, backgrounds. And I want to read you a quote. It's my favorite quote ever uh, in terms of, of this sort of thing and how some things never change in how we deal with uh, human beings and, and the environment. And this is uh, Wilbert McLeod Chapman in 1949, who was a federal fisheries officer in California. And he said the following with what led up to the sardine crisis and what we needed to do about it. I have to get all pumped up for this thing. These conditions involve biological, oceanographic, political, commercial, diplomatic, technological, marketing, academic, economic, and personal relations factors, many of which I do not understand. <laughs> I've come to the conclusion that nobody else understands all these factors and interrelationships either. Therefore, at every opportunity, I seek to thrust together people who have specialized knowledge in one or more of these factors to the end that they jointly can produce decisions and conclusions bearing on this objective that are more sound and practical than those produced by any one individual. Basically saying, we got to get everybody together into a cooperative process and make this stuff work. So we're proud. I, I can tell you personally, I'm proud. The secretary is proud. I think the governor is proud of the work of the many members of the public and the fishing community. And this is not easy for the fishing community. I can guarantee you it's not easy for them. Scientists members of, of, of government, and the private sector, and the legislature have all come together to make something happen. And uh, again, uh, it, it's not easy, but we need all of you to, to try to work to make this thing work. Uh, and I, I, think, uh, I think that, that can, we can do it. So finally, I, I, I think if we all work together, I think we can provide some protection that uh, hopefully will help us in the short term in the next 5, 10, 20 years. But, I think most certainly, you know, our goal is let, let, let's make this a better place for future generations. So that, that's my overview on the Marine Life uh, Protection Act, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions anyone might have. Um, the question is, will there be a comprehensive uh, look at, at, at water quality? And uh, I think the response to that is, hold on, Joe. But uh, I think the response to that is this process will not affect water quality. Uh, water quality may affect this process. Uh, so to the degree that the scientists can define what's, what's going on with water quality and the inputs to water quality and so forth, to the great degree that they're successful in saying here, here, here's what's happening, uh, that will, would be factored, factored in. Um, but, but it's not going to drive, this process will not drive uh, things that are happening, uh, uh, you know, w with treatment or and that sort of thing. <laughs> e eco ecosystem, ecosystem based management, and, and well, first of all, your state tidelands go from the marine high tideland out to the three nautical mile limit. And, uh, you know, ecosystem based management is going to look at anything that impacts the ecosystem, and it's not just the ocean. So uh, it, it's going to be what's, what's happening in that, that area you're referring to uh, in terms of, of how that. Uh, is, is uh, affecting the environment. Uh, it, it's going to look at what's happening up in San Dieguito uh, watershed and how that's affecting the environment and the many efforts to deal with that. It's, it, it, that the, the efforts uh, with restoration there are affecting water quality, they're affecting fisheries habitat, they're affecting a lot of things. So anything we look at in ecosystem-based management is, is going to look at all of the fact, including like the desal plant, like what's, what's going on with the seal issue, uh, and, and, and others, you know, throughout the state. Um, thank you, Brian, very much. It's um, really a pleasure to be here and exercising your patience to stay a little late this evening. Uh, it's a delight to be here in California at this time. This is uh, exciting events that Brian outlined for you and uh, all of us who make our endeavor from ocean sciences uh, really are benefiting from the enthusiasm and efforts that are going on in the state of California. So I'm going to give you a look at um, a little bit different part of the marine protected area activity. I will stress that um, unlike Brian who's a representative of the state and his every word is guarded, uh, I'm allowed to speak with a little more liberty, so I'm going to talk about things that might be a little more controversial. But before I begin, I want to tell you a story, and the story goes like this. There was a uh, Middle Eastern family 
that gave birth to uh, identical twin boys. And while this was a wonderful event, this Middle Eastern family could not afford to raise the boys, so they opted to give them up for adoption. And eventually, one boy was adopted by a family in Spain who named him Juan, and the other boy was adopted by a family in Egypt who named that boy Amal. And the birth mother and the adopted mothers all kept in, one in touch with one another. And after about 10 years, the adopted mother in Spain sent a picture of Juan to the birth mother. And she was so excited. She went to her husband and said, oh, look, I've got this wonderful picture of Juan. Now if I only had a picture of Amal. And her husband says, what? They're identical twins. I mean, if you've seen Juan, you've seen Amal. <laughs> Just, just work on it for a little while. <laughs> OK, so when it comes to MPAs, if you've seen one, you've not seen them all. And what I'm going to do is talk about uh, a couple things here. Brian mentioned the Central Coast, which was established, a uh, set of MPAs were established there in September of 2007. And uh, as part of that exercise, there's been some what we call baseline characterization. What's going on out there? What do these areas look like? Before as just as they're initially created. Then I want to talk about MPAs in other Pacific states. And you'll see where California really is the leader of the pack. I want to talk about the National MPA Network because of, among the hats that I wear, I'm on a member of a federal advisory board for the Marine Protected Area, National Marine Protected Area System. And then finally, I want to talk very, very briefly about strengths and weaknesses of MPAs. But actually, I got my slides a little backwards, and I'm, I'm interested in making sure that you have this take-home message. So I'm going to show these two slides twice. And in Sea Grant, we really try to keep a balanced view. So we present both sides of the picture and understand that this is sort of my take on this. And you may not all agree. But I think that from that elegant description of how the MPAs were created that was presented by Brian, we see a very, very large number of laudable things that will come about because of the creation of MPAs. Protecting the marine environment, allowing depressed or uh, scattered species to recover, reducing conflict and uses of the ocean, uh, preserves cultural heritage, one which I had never thought about before, but was pointed out to me by the national MPA system. And we're preserving valuable environments for the future generation. But in my view, we shouldn't oversell MPAs. And there's some things that I don't think they're going to do, at least not initially, but perhaps in the long run. And maybe Brian, if he's here long enough, he doesn't have to zip off for a flight, can answer some of these issues. I don't see MPAs, at least initially, doing much to change or mitigate uh, unreasonable shoreline development. Perhaps at some point, MPAs will do that, but not change that. Water quality, as Brian mentioned, is going to be a tough issue down here in the southern part of the state. And MPAs really won't change water quality all that much. Likewise with marine debris. And that's because these two items, water things that affect water quality and marine debris, come from places outside of the MPAs and they'll go through the marine protected areas. So initially, we don't expect much change there. I don't see MPAs having much impact, perhaps a small amount, on eroded, restoring eroded beaches. And they're not going to do much to protect species that are highly migratory, those that move through the marine protected areas, other than to offer a little momentary protection. So where are we with the MPA process? Well, hopefully we're not here. I don't think we are here. So a lot of really wonderful work has been done. And uh, let's talk about where we are. Now, the next 12 slides were provided to me through uh, gentleman from a, pro, a company called Impact Assessment, located right here in La Jolla. I'd never heard of this company until about a year and a half ago. Why is that significant? Among the groups that have been supported to look at the baseline, where we started with MPAs in the Central Coast, one of them was charged with the task of looking at the socioeconomic variables. This is probably the most challenging thing. What are we doing as we manage people, and how do they react to the fact that we've sequestered parts of the marine environment? And what are their likely behavior changes? I'm not a social scientist. I'm a biologist. So I'm using these data with some trepidation. But I will point out I think they're really fascinating results and show that we're really achieving a lot of what we've set out to do. So 
Brian, I'm not sure if this is correct, but I hope it is. Take home message from this is that adaptive management is part of the MPA process. That means we're not going to create a static system, but a living system. That we're seeking to improve the management of biologic resources, among other objectives. And that we're going to develop monitoring and evaluation plans as we go along so we can see what we've done and what impacts we're having and are we achieving the desired results. So in that sense of looking at the baseline characteristics in the central coast, here were some of the objectives from that socioeconomic study. We are, after all, managing people who fish. We're not managing the fish. They're going to still do their thing. But we can determine a lot of very interesting things. What are the motivations for people to remain fishing in light of the fact that we're creating MPAs? How can we minimize the social and economic impacts of creating these zones? And can we distinguish pre-MPA effects from post-MPA effects? In many cases, the answers to all these questions is yes. So one thing we want to recognize is that before the Central Coast MPAs came along, there were a lot of stresses on the fishing community. They're dealing with a depleted or rapidly depleting resource. And many steps have been taken both by federal and state authorities to change the way the fishers behave. As a consequence, they were already under some duress. And it's unfair to say that as the MPAs came along, they added to that duress because, as you can see, starting in 1994, using rockfish and ground fish in this example, there's been a lot of regulations imposed on the fishing community. The question is, are these people going to die a death of a thousand cuts? And will this be the thousandth cut that kills them? The answer seems to be no. You've seen some variant of these slides before. These are adapted specifically for that central coast region of California where the MPAs were put in place in 2007. The general direction of each of these slides is the same. The pink line or the magenta line is for all of California. And the blue line is for just the study region. So for number of fishing vessels in the fleet, there's been a decline since the early 1980s through the mid 2007s. Number of fishing licenses, likewise a decline. So things were already on the decline. In fact, this speaks toward rationale for why we need these MPAs. Pounds of fish landed, likewise there's been a slow but sure decline. And revenues, likewise a decline. So this was an area that really needed some attention before the MPAs came along. One fact, however, that escapes a lot of folks is life isn't static. And on this graph, we see the decline in the number of commercial fishing vessels in the Central Coast from the mid-1980s through the mid-2000s, 1885 to 2000. And notice the difference in the scale. This is 0 to 3,000, and this is 0 to 60,000. So this is the result of the decline of the commercial fishers, commercial fishing vessels. And this is the increase in the recreational fishing vessels. So a lot of things going on out there. And it shows that while there has been change in the commercial fishing industry, there's also been change going on in the recreational community. And not to our surprise, there's been a change in the, in the nature of the catch as well. So, 1995 to 1999 is represented by the blue bars. 2000 to 2006 represented by the magenta bars. As you can see, as the pelagics and ground fish populations, especially the ground fish populations, declined, fisheries were also declining and replaced to a large extent by market squid. OK, so the fishing community was under stress. And here was perhaps the biggest stress that they faced, which has nothing to do with fish populations at all. It's something that you and I know so painfully well, the pain at the pump. Well, there's the pain at the gas pump for the fishermen as well. So these people are really struggling because fishing stocks are declining and gasoline prices are going up. It's just harder to make a go of it. So from all of this, we now have the creation of marine protected areas. Essentially, we're beginning to sequester their fishing holes. Again, is this the thousandth cut in a death of a thousand cuts. 
So this slide is a little hard to read with apologies because it's a little washed out, but this is the Monterey Peninsula right in the heart of the Central Coast area. These green lines demark the marine protected areas and there's actually uh, 12 of them in this diagram. So what happens when you tell someone who's fishing you can't go there anymore or if you can go there it's restricted? So overlaying on top of that same diagram is where the prime rock fishing habitat is located. So in this case, yes, we did sequester pieces of their fishing habitat, but we certainly didn't take it away from them. They, they adapted. We're talking about adaptive management. The fishers recognized that they're going to have a change and they're going to adapt to the change. In fact, through the socioeconomic studies, many fishers said they were glad the MPAs came into place because it, in essence, reduced the conflict that was very prevalent before that. Now they're saying the waterfront has literally been divvied up. We know what we can do. Not necessarily the case everywhere, however. Here is a different part of the Central Coast, a little farther south. Do I have my geography correct? Morro Bay. And we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six larger MPAs here. And a, a bunch of other little squiggles on that diagram. So what these are is we forget sometimes that the ocean is used by a wide variety of individuals, many who don't fish. So we've got little symbols for scuba diving, for surfing, kayaking, kiteboarding, and windsurfing. And you can see they're all sprinkled quite liberally along this coast. It's a very, very popular area. A lot of it for what we call non-consumptive uses. So we've got MPAs in there. What's going to happen? If we ask the fishing community, where are you going to go look for rockfish? What they tell us is where the magenta occurs along the coast is their best fishing hole. But now their best fishing holes have been largely sequestered by the MPAs. Yes, they will adapt. And what they tell us is these areas that are being reflected by the circles showing up on the screen represent where they'll end up conducting their fishing activities. There has been adaptation. The problem here is that falls right smack in the middle of those non-consumptive areas. So as we begin to look at the MPAs, we need to recognize that the system we're creating has a great number of laudable merits, but it has to be flexible. We have to consider all sides of the arguments. And by talking to the individuals, we're getting there. Just very briefly, Brian mentioned the north central coast. So even if you say, aha, I'm no longer going to fish in the central coast, I'm going to go north or I'm going to go south, eventually there'll be MPAs in all places. So it's a matter of learning to adapt in, with the system. So now briefly, let's talk about some of the other states. Uh, California is really the leader in creating MPAs. Let me just back up a second. This is a wonderful document. I uh, don't know if you can read that. It's called The State of U.S. Marine Protected Areas, Managed, Marine Managed Areas, West Coast. You can't read the date, but it was May 2008, so it's very contemporary. And if you're interested in this subject, really encourage you to take a look at this document. Easy to read, very, very full of information. So, some of the things that I gleaned. California's got a lot of MPAs. You currently have 189 of them sequestering 47% of the coast. 91% of these are multiple use, and 9% of them are no take. Oregon, by contrast, has not got as far. They have only 23 MPAs covering a mere 3% of the coast. 95% of these are multiple use and 5% of these are no take. Washington sort of falls between. They've got 26% of their coast sequestered in MPAs, but 100% of those are multiple use. There are no no take reserves. And then finally, Hawaii. Now, this is the segue where I'll talk about the national system of MPAs, but Hawaii has got sort of the, pardon the expression, the big kahuna of all MPAs. <laughs> As many of you know, this enormous national monument was created, and this was done via a process of literally the president with a stroke of a pen. 
This was creation of a national monument. It wasn't a highly vetted process like Brian described for what's going on in California. Is that good or bad? I don't know. The sequestering of this huge part of the, of the ocean is very laudable, but it's certainly a big impact. So what about the national scene? As I mentioned early on, I'm a member of this national, a member actually of a federal advisory committee to the National System of Marine Protected Areas. It is embryonic. The MPA Center within the National Ocean Service of NOAA has a budget of only about $1.6 million a year. One third of that budget goes to hosting federal advisory committee meetings, literally our care, of our, our care and feeding. So they're not going to accomplish a lot with that level of funding. That is not to say that they don't have ambition and they aren't making an effort. So I joined the Federal Advisory Committee in early 2008. The first item on our agenda for a meeting that we held in April was to discuss this framework for creating the national MPA system. Framework was out there. Federal public comments were accepted until the end of April. It's starting. So what's it going to mean? Well, in essence, the federal government has said, you folks in the states and in the regions are identifying marine protected areas. We're going to sweep them up in an umbrella under our umbrella and call it a national MPA system. There won't be any true new federal MPAs, not, in, not at least initially through this process. And they'll be creating categories of MPAs, uh, heritage MPAs, and those for sustainable production. Again, though, this is largely an exercise where the government will review existing MPAs already, in the, already identified in the states. This is the process to become part of the national system of MPAs. You become an MPA either by nominating yourself or by having your managing agency nominate you. Public comments are then welcome and accepted. The agency, in this case the federal agency, will review the nomination and then accept that MPAs will be a place in the system. So where are we? Again, hopefully not in the belly of a snake. Uh, in this case, it's literally the launch is this week. And um, I'm sorry, it's next week, one week ahead of myself. So please join us to celebrate the launch of the National System Marine Protected Areas on Thursday, November 28th, November 20th, 2008. It's just beginning on the federal level. They're quite far behind where we are in the state levels. Okay, so in conclusion, I want to repeat those same two slides I showed you earlier but with the overlay of what Brian told you earlier and what I just had to say. That we can expect a lot of very laudable things from the MPAs, but we can't expect them to be the be-all, end-all. We also need to be very, very cognizant that there are a lot of different sides of the argument and as we go along, we should adapt and as a consequence develop the best possible system for marine protected areas, both within our state and nationally. So hopefully, I've left you like this. And with that, uh, I thank you, and of course, I'm willing to answer any questions. What, the question is, what benefits can the state expect from the federal government token, taking over the MPAs? Um, I'm not going to quite, that's like Brian, it's time to go now. I'm not going to quite answer that. The federal government is not going to take over the MPAs. All they're going to do is designate them as part of the national system. So it would be akin to saying we've got a state park and it's going to be part of the national park system. The MPAs created by the state of California will remain under the state of California jurisdiction. So there'll be no change in that regard. It's really going to be initially for the federal system largely a paper exercise. So the question was, um, we're making good progress here in California as I showed from those three, sli four sli three slides of California, Oregon, and Washington. So how are the other states doing and coming together and creating their MPAs? It's uh, largely a public-driven process, and it really depends on the receptivity of the public. So that's a precursor to say that in Washington state, they're a little middle of the road. In Oregon, they're a little more slow at getting to the mark. And uh, that's a lot to do with the heritage of fishing in those states. Uh, so they're, they're all engaged in the same process. They're all at different levels of the same process. And they're all, the states are engaging with 
differing levels of intensity. Uh, I anticipate that they'll all come, this, those other states will all come along when they'll catch up with California is a very good question. <laughs>